welcome to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today we talk with, or we have the great pleasure of having Hendrik with us, Hendrik Kutov, who is the head of education at Jena School for Microbial Communication in Germany, and also a mental health advocate and public speaker. Um, I guess mostly on that topic, but also um, versatile, no, interested in many different topics. Um, some of which you are, we hope we can also hear from you today. Welcome, Hendrik. Hi, thank you for having me. It's it's a great pleasure, and it's been also in within the context of the Remo organization, the um, researcher mental health organization, that I saw a talk by you where you talked about the mental health first aid um program that you are uh, um like also heading at Jena university i suppose so could you talk maybe also talk about a little bit why you got engaged in that topic and also what that program is all about yeah sure so I mean, it's maybe a little bit of a, a long story, but um, I, I, I came to the University of Vienna in 2017 um, to head the or manage the graduate school in microbiology, the Vienna School for Microbial Communication that you already mentioned. And I had previously worked for 14 years at King's College London, where I had started as a postdoc in virology and had worked my way up to group leader and um, and also lecturer, but, and, you know, we don't need to get into the details about that just now, but I was ready for a change in career. And I thought science management um, appealed, really appealed to me. And then I got this excellent opportunity at the um, Schiller University in Jena. And I suppose I got the job because I am of German heritage, but I had always lived abroad. And I came to the University of Jena at a time when they were just preparing a massive application to the German Research Foundation to set up one of the excellence clusters. Um, that was eventually successful. And I was part of the team to draft and write this proposal. And it, it really was a spirit of innovation and ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and, and we did put together, I think, a, a really creative and innovative research program um, where we tried to study microbiomes um, really across the board. So we want to learn what, or see what we can learn from microbiomes that are present in humans, but also on trees and in water and see if we can understand the similarities. Can but you just, along... sorry, just sorry to interrupt, can you just yeah, sure. explain what microbiomes are for those of us? So around? microbiomes is basically, that's what we call the community or collection of microbes that live on or in a certain spe uh, mm -hmm. specified space. So for instance, your skin has a microbiome. That's a collection of microbes that live on your skin um, that protect us also from invaders and infections. Mm -hmm. And your gut has a microbiome, a collection of microbes that digest our food for us. And so um, we really wanted to elevate this kind of research away from looking what is there because traditionally this kind of research was, was quite encyclopedic, I guess, by just looking what is there and cataloging it. Mm -hmm. But we really wanted to move it towards a more functional understanding. And, and from that also sprang the idea, uh, and I, I will never forget this in one of the brainstorming meetings when one of the professors said, well, you know, the, the gut is just another aqueous environment. And, and this was a professor who studied the uh, marine microbiology so so the mic microbes that live in the oceans and I, and I and i know i can talk about microbes for forever so i i, I want to bring this a um, little bit to a close but i wanted to say that it was a spirit of innovation and we alongside the scientific part of the proposal we also needed to present um infrastructural innovations that we would bring to the university and I had, in my previous position at King's College London, I had been departmental well-being officer for PhDs. I had also been a mentor for undergraduate studies. And it was also 2017, around the time that Catulavac's um, watershed paper came out showing that um, the 
pursuing a PhD is associated with a twofold risk in uh, mental health or in, in having a mental illness or a problem with your mental health. Mm. Um, I personally knew this to be true because I had a mental health condition myself when I did a PhD, had an anxiety disorder. We can talk in a bit more detail about that. Um, so in drafting this proposal, I was very keen on trying to include what I thought was really forward thinking um, ideas about how we, how we can deal better with well-being and mental health at universities, where I also felt that there wasn't a whole lot available at, at the uh, Friedrich Schiller University at the time. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, a lot of my ideas didn't make it into, into the final proposal, because as it goes with science, this is also always limited to certain page numbers, and then the science, of course, um, gets precedent over what is seen to be marginal topics of interest. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, that didn't stop me. And it kind of also prepared, I suppose, the leadership um, that these, these topics are important. And so uh, regardless of whether we directly got funding for it, I started initially to, uh, to just uh, organize a couple of events um, informing about mental health because there had been signals from the PhD and postdoc community that there certainly was a, um, an interest and a need for it. Actually, in my first couple of weeks of taking the job, I had received an email from a postdoc who, who was struggling. Um, and I, I'll, never, I'll never know why, but I somehow succeeded at getting Katja Levesque to speak at our university at that time. And this was really right off of the back of her paper. Mm -hmm. And she must have gotten uh, invitations to speak everywhere in the world. And I don't know why she, she, she answered positively to ours, but she made it all the way to Jena. And, and Jena is not the easiest place to travel to. Um, but, and that was wonderful. That, that really, we had a, a really full auditorium um, and uh, it has to be said, though, that the resonance for the topic was primarily with postdocs and PhDs. I had invited the entire university leadership and nobody of them showed up, with, with the exception of the leadership of our, our graduate academy. Do you, and, do you have a guess why that is? Is it because it's still stigma around the topic? Well, I have a little bit a, a theory about that. Um, so, and, and this is also the stark contrast that I experienced in moving from the UK to Germany in the willingness and openness to talk about these subjects where in the UK, there are multiple charities dealing with mental health and there are very prominent people speaking about mental health uh, and not in the least Prince William and Prince Harry who, who are very open about all what happened to them in the wake of the passing of their mother living a public life and so forth. Um, so mental health is a far easier subject to talk about in the UK than it is in Germany. Hmm. I also believe uh, with, with, with some reference to that from personal experience, my, my parents are both Germany, but they moved to the Netherlands uh, from before I could even remember. Um, but I did have German grandparents who, who lived in Germany and, and that generation had obviously gone through a, a traumatic historic event uh, that was treated by not speaking of, of it. You know, that was um, the way of dealing with Germany's tragic past. You did not speak about that. that at least that was my experience. And Could it also be, I, I've been wondering about that. Also now, I'm, I'm also currently working with Ukrainian researchers a small group um, who obviously go through all kinds of um, immediate challenges, most of which also um, eat into the mental well-being or kind of, yeah, so it's, it's heavy on them. But like in the post-war era, there was nowhere to go, right? So people, mm. I mean, other than like, oh, you also struggle, but what else could you do about it? And things had to move on one way or the other. Otherwise, you just sit and bury your head in the sand. And and then what? Like, 
And maybe that's also a coping mechanism to have to continue if you want to live, you have to keep moving. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, there are extreme scenarios in the way. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to, to explain history, but yeah. it is, of course, also true that we know in retrospect, it, the Nazis didn't go away, you know, a and lot of them yeah. were, were still in public office. A lot of them had a very dubious past and didn't want people prodding around in, in it. Uh, only very, very few of them actually um, were presented with any legal or, or punitive consequences to, to their behavior and involvement. So, and then, then of course, now I live in the east of Germany, there was a, a whole other cultural traumatic experience that happened there as well. And, and mm -hmm. that also was not quite prepared by moving here, how, how the east of Germany is still substantially different and and the east of germany 30 years later after mm. the reunification and and again i feel there's a lot of trauma there that, that isn't talked about and it and i've come i've come to view that but that's my personal view as a kind of a, a german way of mm. we don't talk about that but and here comes the big but the pandemic has massively changed that um, i've noticed that with the pandemic suddenly the willingness to speak about mental health has, has taken a complete U-turn. And uh, of course, my involvement with this preceded the pandemic. And, you know, thank God, because we, we, we established our mental health first aid team at this university in kind of in the middle of the pandemic. And there was really quite a lot of demand for that. Mm. Um, but I also then noticed that that changed attitudes and people who had previously told me, this isn't a problem, don't go creating one. Uh, suddenly also were very supportive and said to me like you were absolutely right and I'm so glad glad you you you've carried on with this mm -hmm. so and and perhaps this is a um, a good moment to to at least mention to our listeners um, that what it is that we did so here at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena we set up the first mental health first aid team at a German university Mental health first aid is something that was developed by the Australian Public Health Services. It's an evidence-based intervention for people in acute crisis of, or, or, or stuck in a rut with their mental health, their well-being. And it's analogous to first aid for physical medical problems. So the, the uh, equivalent of learning CPR, but mm -hmm. for somebody who, is, who finds themselves in a mental health crisis. So it's not a form of therapy. It is not a way of diagnosing. Um, as somebody who's a mental health first aider is not a trained psychologist and doesn't need to be. But what you learn is you get given the tools and the structured way of um, leading conversations with these, with, with these cases, with these people in distress to arrive at what can be the best possible solution for that person. And then in most cases, that means um, passing on or referring to specialists if there's a need for therapy, but a lot of cases don't need a need for therapy and or don't have a need for therapy. And, and in particular, during the pandemic, we noticed a lot of people just needed someone to listen to them. Mm. And a lot of people, when you give them the opportunity to speak about what's going on, what's wrong, will find their own solutions when mm. they are um, presented with somebody who will listen. So that's what we did. We've, uh, and, and part of the reason why it took till the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, is there wasn't an accredited provider of mental health first aid in Germany until that time. Mm -hmm. And so they were established at the end of 2020. And that is the Central Institute for Mental Health Research in Mannheim under the um, uh, guidance of Professor Deutschler. And he set that up. And since then, um, mental health first aid has been steadily growing in, in Germany and the courses are almost always fully booked. Um, Was the Mannheim team already in touch with the Australian founders? Or did you... So they have to be, yes. They, 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 the, the, um, the accreditation to deliver the mental health first training in Germany mm -hmm. is 
by applying to um, Mental Health International, which is a Mental Health First Aid International, which is seated in Australia. And so this is a lengthy process mm. of getting that accreditation. And um, that's why it took some time to get that sorted in Germany. Now, there are lots of different countries in the world that haven't got an accredited mental health provider, a mental health first aid provider yet. For instance, in the entire Spanish speaking world, there isn't yet an accredited mental health first aid provider. There so an there's an opportunity out there for somebody. I guess, yeah. Is there like, um, I guess on the mental health first aid website, right? They probably have an overview of the existing institutions. Yes, so uh, the easiest way to find that is to um, Google Mental Health First Aid International. That's when you land on the Australian homepage, mm. who are the umbrella organization for this. And they are the ones that provide the accreditation and making sure that all the standards are adhered to. And that's where you can apply to become a national provider. Um, and so trainings within Germany can only be offered by the German accredited office, likewise in the UK and in France, Netherlands, uh, India. Those are a couple of the countries that I know off the top of my head mm -hmm. that do have mental health first aid. Um, so yeah, and that has, that has really proven quite successful, uh, successful in two senses that we we experience that there is definitely a lot of demand for it so um people are taking up this opportunity to come speak to a mental health first aider we make it absolutely clear on our website that everything is confidential um so we don't share any information unless the person who contacts us expressly asks us to contact somebody else on their behalf which has happened in the past as well. Um, and so it's, it is successful from that perspective. We get a, a lot of interest in it. It is also successful from the other angle. We find a lot of the employees at the universities are very, very keen to become a first aider and to help in that capacity. Mm -hmm. So we have since the beginning of this year implemented the training in-house. So we've got some of our university staff um, trained to be a trainer and we can now offer the mental health first aid courses in-house to our university employees and those courses are almost immediately fully booked uh, the moment we announce them and if I'm not mistaken we've now had two editions of 20 participants each so we've we've uh, educated about 40 mental health first aiders at our university, but not everybody wants to be publicly listed on our mental health first aid webpage as such. For instance, there are some who see this more as a support to the work they are already doing, such as our ombudspersons, for instance. I know mm -hmm. that a couple of them have had this training. Um, also, the people who are generally in the student advisory or counseling services um, where students come with all sorts of questions. And indeed, when we first launched this, this mental health first aid team and we didn't have the in-house training yet, um, that started with a group of volunteers who all were in the managerial or counseling layer of the university and who, who's, who's part, of the, or part of their responsibilities included um, being a contact person for students or PhDs to speak to. And, and almost without exception, these people would say, including myself, um, you know, PhDs come to us with all problems, whether it be they don't know how to register for a certain course at the university or for their defense or getting their residency permit or finding a flat or having a, an issue with their supervisor or mm -hmm. having generally a well-being issue. Um, so the, those people with those problems, they would come to us anyway. And we were not fortified. We were not trained to deal with some of the issues that people would present us with. And, and prior to having been trained as a mental health first aider, 
it would quite frequently happen to me that someone would, would come to me and open up about their problems. And I would do the best I could. But afterwards, you still have then this nagging feeling of, did I do the right thing? Did I advise them properly? Uh, I hope that I hope they're going to be all right. And, and I hope I didn't say anything wrong. And the good thing is that as a mental health first aider, you are trained in how to deal with these situations. You follow a certain protocol. And when that intervention is over, you know you've done the right thing. So I have no more sleepless nights. I don't lie around worrying about these people. Mm. Um, and it, of course, you can't help everybody, but that also helps me distance myself from it. Even though, even if an intervention did not, if, if it didn't go well, I know that I've done the best I could. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it is always down to the individual whether they want to accept help whether they are willing to accept that they might have a problem. Some people might not accept that they have a problem. I can't make them accept that they have a problem. Yeah. And one of the worst things you can do is to say to somebody, it looks to me like you've got a problem. You should speak to a psychiatrist or a is psychologist. Is that the first thing that comes to mind that you want to say, though? I mean, yeah, before exactly. the training, probably. Yeah. Right? And so that is, uh, and what you learn in the training is to listen. Mm. and um, to uh, from there identify and, and just ask small questions that guide the discussion in a certain direction and thereby to ascertain how willing the person is to accept help um, and how, how how far they are in the process of, of realizing that they have a problem or not and and the funny thing as, as a mental health first aider we also learn because there's always a question what is what is mental health and when does it become mental illness or or a problem with your mental health and the definition that i've learned is the moment it impacts on the quality of life of that individual it becomes a problem but so long as the individual does not um observe or 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 uh, experience it as an as a um compromise of their quality of life then for them, there isn't a problem. And then there is no point in you telling them that there is a problem. You're not going to achieve anything by it. So, and that's not your role. Your yeah. role is to support somebody who wants to be supported. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't give CPR to a random person on the street. If you look, <laughs> if you think their speech is a bit slur. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Know? From your experience, um, first of all, I'd like to know, now that the mental health office is I guess it's well known across institutions so people who think they might help can seek help and probably also do. How many inquiries do you get per month or per week or like, so is it being currently busy? in the summer months it's it's very quiet mm -hmm. and in the winter months it gets really busy. So in the busiest time of year, I get about two or three um, requests for for meetings per week. Oh, and I've okay. had weeks. When it comes close to Christmas, where I've had an intervention almost daily. Is this mostly for international students who struggle with the darkness? In no, I mean there. It is noticeable that there is a over representation of international students, hmm. but um, it is uh, it is by no means um, limited, and quite a few of the German nationals uh, ha have come to us as well, hmm. um, and. But I would say that was probably more during the time when, when there were still lockdowns, right? And mm -hmm. I guess in that context, uh, we all were faced with the same struggles. Mm -hmm. But um, no, we, we, get, we get both. And, and the interesting thing, actually, that I should mention is when we set up the mental health first aid team at the university, It came from a group of volunteers who were basically all connected with PhD programs at the university. And, it, and in fact, the original study by Katja Levesque also specifically addressed the mental health of those pursuing a PhD. Now that we have our mental health first aid team operational, I noticed that the majority of cases that um, request help are master students, actually. Mm -hmm. Much more so than PhDs or postdocs. It's the master students that want to. Uh, 
won't help. Yeah. Do you, and, and that's something why we that is. Well. Is there more thereof at the university or? I don't know. I mean, of course, when you're a master's student, it's it's in early adulthood. This might be a lot of people who, for the first time, are not living in their parents' house anymore. So it's it's mm. a, a a period of great transition. Uh, of trying to find your own feet in this world. Um, we know that mental illness or any sort of uh, mental health conditions primarily arise during the ages of 18 and the late 20s. That is the age bracket where you're at greatest risk for developing a mental health condition. Hmm. Um, and it really starts to, to kick off just about at the age of 18 and I can make sense of that but as a personal point of view it is the transitionary phase where you are leaving childhood behind and trying to find your own identity and find your own place in this world and yes that that comes with all sorts of struggles pressures anxieties questions and so uh, it's perhaps not a surprising thing but I think the important thing to realize there is this age bracket is precisely the clientele that we have at universities. Mm -hmm. Those who study and work with us as PhDs or postdocs are between 18 and late 20s. And so from the mm -hmm. age demographic, they are the highest risk group for incidents of mental health conditions. And, and this is precisely what happened to me. So an, another very sad um, statistic is that it takes people on average eight years from the onset of their mental health condition to the point where they are ready to seek out help or therapy. Mm. And that is what happened to me as well. So my mental health condition, which was an anxiety disorder, and that means fear. I mean, where anxiety might sound to sound like it's, you know, not not so serious a problem, but it, it meant extreme fear. I was, I, I was at times unable to leave my room because I had, was afraid of just about anything. Retrospectively, it's very clear to me that that developed when I first went to university. That's when the onset was, but it's gradual and it gets worse. Mm -hmm. And it got to a crisis point wh when I, came to the end of my PhD. And of course, that is a very stressful situation when you hand in your thesis and you have to write your thesis and defend your thesis. Um, and that's right, right around that time is when it really came crashing down around me. And that's when I decided to look for help. And that's when I recognized this had been going on for a long time. This, uh, well, this hadn't come out of the blue. So I'm, I'm a very classical case. Um, anxiety started just around the age of 18. Uh, I'll also not make a secret of it. I, I, I moved to university in Amsterdam and of course uh, there was lots of um, illicit chemical, uh, how do you say, uh, recreational use going on in that time as well, which certainly didn't contribute to my well-being. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's where I can re retrospectively completely recognize that's that's where it started going wrong. Hmm. And, I, I, I myself, I've struggled with depressive episodes. Also, like it also I have those too. <laughs> you, you got this on top. Oh. Um, yeah. Also, the 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 it's not uncommon that you experience several. Um, so it's not symptoms, but illnesses, or what's categorized as illnesses. But well, um, they are symptoms. They are definitely symptoms. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, but different. I think the the effect on our bodies and our well being or not so well being is the same. Like I couldn't leave the house. I felt like, um, what am I doing here? Like I worked so much and so little outcome. Um, yeah. But I, I developed over the years also um, seeking help with um, several specialists and uh, therapists that I think it's it's pretty normal to have a precondition to I mean it's 
like one of my doctors said it's just another organ in the brain and of course it yeah. can dysfunction and of course it can get to its limits and um so i'm coming towards the question what do you think is specific of um mental i don't want to say the word i mean it's also gradual process progress as you said to talk about um, mental issues or mental health issues um mental disorders mental illnesses when is it an illness that needs extra treatment with medication or um and and so, uh, the, the, the easy know. answer to that is i can't <laughs> answer that last question because that requires a specialist to make yeah, a no, i wasn't even going I don't there make a diagnosis. but just, I do want just to say about something the process of the language i was trying to say like you know like when we talk about mental well-being and mental health in this context now, so with the first aid approach that you you're practicing with your team, um, is like what are okay. So rewinding a little bit, so what are the symptoms that people come with when they realize I need to talk about what I'm experiencing and I can't quite figure out if it's anxiety or depression or whatever it might be. They but I know I I have an issue. Like what are again, what is, again, that, is being so, that is so diverse for each individual, mm -hmm. and yeah. something might be unacceptable to someone, and they might be willing to much earlier step to the plate and not leave it for eight years like I did. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you raised a really interesting point there, namely when when I speak with about mental health, and I'm very open about my my previous issues with that. I've, I've, what, in, what I find interesting is that almost everybody will say, well, yes, I, you know, I've also experienced episodes of, mm -hmm. of depression. And I think that probably almost everybody does. Um, I think it is kind of ridiculous to expect us to be mentally healthy all the time. And what you said is absolutely right. Our brain, our mind is another organ which will sometimes not be in great health just like some of the other organs we all certainly in this day and age um take it for granted that we will have an illness of one form or another at some point um and then we will just have to lie in bed for a week or so and then we feel better now that's not necessarily the way you fix a mental health problem or a well-being condition i believe that those are usually sorted by speaking about them um, but the bottom line is that we can't expect ourselves to be always mentally fit and always mentally healthy. And that's another reason why I think it is so important that we reduce the stigma about it and that we stop. And that's, I think, particularly prevalent in Germany or used to be these really negative language associated with mental health, where it's often easily uh spoken as oh well you belong in, in an institution or you're crazy and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. we don't do that when when somebody has has an illness and broken their leg we don't say well you know he's a cripple for the rest of his life and i'm sorry and i really don't want to offend anybody who has a chronic uh, condition with with their uh with their legs or anything like that but we we, we tend to be much more careful in our language when it comes to to physical health and uh, wishing people the best in their recovery and a quick recovery. And when it comes to mental health, there is very quickly quite negative language associated with it, which prevents people from seeking the help that is out there. And that doesn't need to mean uh, institutionalization for sure. It doesn't need to mean a chemical or, or pharmaceutical intervention. It can sometimes mean speaking to a first aider just for one hour. Mm. I have had several cases of people who came to me at their wits end and we spoke for an hour and they said, fabulous. I won't go as far as to say problem solved, but like maybe a week or so later, I might've gotten an email uh, yeah. and they said, this has helped me so much. And, and, yeah. Is it probably also problem. to know that you're not the only one? Like that was an eye opener for me. Like, well, I'm not the only one experiences these feelings of in insecurity and loneliness and whatever you know comes together to make it feel awful. Um, but there's, it's, it's, yeah, as I said, it's, it's actually normal. 
and especially under the pressure that we live as academics, it's it's it must be um, anticipated to some extent because we can, we are expected to work more than hundred um, percent. I myself didn't even think about taking holidays, even though by my working contract I was of course entitled to take holidays. But then you constantly think, oh, I don't have re enough results. Of course, you need to accomplish that before I can even start thinking about it. and then asking my boss. And my boss was probably very approachable on that, but I didn't allow myself a holiday or a mm -hmm. weekend off or anything like that. So the work, the pressure that we put on ourselves as scholars with the expectations. And dismanagement thereof must lead into mental health cases or issues. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I I believe so. And and it's you know the also the perception that the academic career trajectory is somehow the softer one compared with business. I'm I don't think it's true. Um, I mean, yes, I know a lot of people in the business sector who work very hard, but it is also very clear when they're on holiday, they're on holiday done you know don't call me on my holiday and i've started to adopt that um, that as well and yeah i when i was still in research if i went on holiday well there was a a, a sizable portion of my suitcase was allocated for the papers i'd printed out to be reading on holiday mm -hmm. and uh, or the paper to be working on while i was on holiday mm -hmm. and so really taking a break is something that's quite rare for academics i think um, and I think there's a lot to be gained in, in how we approach working culture in academia to normalize just taking a holiday and saying, I'm really not available. I'm really not available to do any peer review. I'm really not available to, to write another paper or yeah. to read papers. I'm on holiday. Uh, I've often also um, mentioned that in any of my training, scientific um, writing or research data management so remind people of when when we talk about time management like make sure you take holidays but then some people say but i have um lab animals to take care of then it's yeah. a question of managing that there's other people who will be at the institute around that time you can delegate towards yeah so it's just a management question and speaking up that you need assistance you cannot be there for the animals 24 7. um yeah and that these, these are so, so there are solutions are readily available but oftentimes there is a feeling of i need to fix it myself i should mm. know this myself i'm now a phd student i must know this but i don't i know what <laughs> and yeah. then the vicious cycle starts um so what is there anything in particular like that you see specific to academics that is being mentioned as a cause or a trigger the workload, the publication pressure. I mean, we are I think, but I, you know, I think you, you, you've, and those are two key points. Mm -hmm. I think another one that is uh, is causing a lot of people anxiety is, is job insecurity. Mm -hmm. We are always dealing with short term contracts. Uh, uh, you know, open ended or permanent contracts are a rare thing, and by the time you've achieved it, you've kind of had to elbow your way up. Uh, a significant part of the ladder anyway before we start talking about any sort of permanent contracts i believe that um academia is suffering for it because we, i i do believe we need much more positions where a permanent position really does doesn't happen unless it's a professorship right and i think we also need more perspectives in academia for people who say i don't want to be at the top of the uh, you know of the pyramid but i would like to remain a researcher um, and do research without having to worry of every three years to get another grant in i just want to work in the laboratory mm. the irony is that or or labor laboratory i say that because that's where i come from mm. i want to do uh, research in libraries and, and look at old texts or whatever do field work if that's what you love the irony is, if you pursue that, the lifespan of the, that phase of your career is very, very limited indeed, because in order to stay in that industry, you need to progress beyond it, where you become a professor, and a professor is essentially a manager without any management training, mm -hmm. and, uh, and a grant writer, and, and you don't get to do what you love doing, which is yeah. working in the laboratory or in, in, in the field. And 
I think that leads to a lot of the problems we are faced with in academia. One of the solutions I can see is to create more positions for people to do the actual lab work, field work, um, literature research that they love mm -hmm. without having to progress to a leadership role for which by and large, most people who arrive at that point have had no training whatsoever. And so you get brilliant chemists who are suddenly without any prior preparation, having to deal with a, a, managing a group of 30, 40 people and they don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, some people do that, you know, I've seen brilliant scientists who are natural leaders. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are out there, but that does not excuse us from targeting this problem uh, structurally and not assuming that because you are a brilliant scientist, you automatically are also a natural leader because most of us aren't. Most of us need to learn it. Mm. So do you see, because you mentioned earlier that most people that um, come to your office and seek assistance from your team are early career researchers, master and PhD and also postdoc um, mm -hmm. career stage. What about the seniors? Are, yeah. are they approaching you sometimes during lunch, like the unofficial pathway? No, I've also had senior group leaders um, requesting um, mental health first aid a, a meeting with me. Um, primarily, very few of them uh, have spoken to me about their personal problems. Mostly it was when they were concerned about somebody in their team mm -hmm. and they didn't know how to deal with it. Mm. Um, I think it might still be difficult to accept perhaps for somebody in a leadership position to speak to a peer or God forbid somebody who in the hierarchy is below them and open up about their mental health. That might be a hurdle that is slightly too, too big for some people to take. Um, but I have had uh, group leaders who were concerned about people in their group and wanted advice on how, how they can best support them, how they can best deal with that. You know, mm -hmm. And we've actually also um, had a training for uh, for our group leaders precisely on this subject so we got a trainer in so what what do i do to support the well-being of my team members so what do you do can you share one two or three things that it's again it's it's mostly about listening it's mm. similar to what i've said before saying that hey looks like you've got a problem you should see a psychologist uh is is really not going to work and so when you see that somebody isn't functioning very well and to come in and say, well, no, this is not working, but what's, what's going on here? Uh, it is perhaps not the right way, um, but, or, you know, this is not working, you should do it differently. It could be well meant, but it's, it's not likely to, to fall on fertile ground uh, with a person being spoken to. Mm. Um, so always the best thing is to ask. And so if you notice that somebody in your team is despondent or not showing up or always being late for meetings, is to just say, hey, you know, I, I noticed you were, you were late for the meeting again this time. Is there anything the matter? We can talk about it if you want, you know. Um, and uh, we can see if, if we can maybe change something in, in, in your working um, schedule that will make things easier for you if if there's something that's preventing you from being on time in our meetings what can we do to make it better it's about being open listening and not dishing out advice too quickly mm. and then also like i'm trying to think about my relationship with my then supervisor and when i realize I, things are not working my brain is not functioning i can't concentrate and you don't want to necessarily share that with your boss or with your PI. So, mm -hmm. and then thinking about, I mean, my we we had regular meetings, and then I just found myself retracting myself more and more. Um, so I don't know whatever he, I mean, he said a few things. I don't know if there would have been anything that would have, in a reasonable time frame, solved the situation. I don't know. I mean, eventually it got solved. I got my PhD, but, but it's been a training process, I think, for us both. 
But that's precisely where I think an institution, a university, can really help by creating a space where it is easier to talk about this. By, you know, we have a mental health first aid team. People know this, they've seen that in the newsletter. Every diversity market, every, um, uh, every induction week for students and PhDs and postdocs, I'm there with my poster to remind people, we have a mental health first aid team. Don't suffer in silence, come speak to us. That's what we're there for. And I think that helps create um, a culture, an environment where people hopefully feel safer to speak about this. I imagine when you did your PhD, nobody was speaking about this and therefore it then becomes more difficult to say to your supervisor, you know what, I might be struggling with my mental health. This is all a bit too much for me. And I hope that by these kind of measures, we also create an environment where people do have the courage to say that and mm. where we normalize saying that. Mm. And because in the end, it helps productivity. If you just gonna keep carrying on and say, no, I'm gonna, I have to do that paper anyway, I have to do this experiment anyway, guess what? Your experiment's gonna fail then. Yeah. Your paper, it, you know, it will be rejected at one journal or another before it gets published. We all have those experiences. Just banging your head against the wall when pushing through isn't always the answer. And sometimes taking a step back is the answer. Mm. Um, and so I hope that, uh, that, that that is, apart from whether people come speak to us, I hope that a secondary effect that we achieve is just to normalize these conversations about it. Mm. and empower people to say yeah i am going to look after my mental health it's important yeah some some things that we've also identified on previous episodes um of this podcast on mental well-being is that we can preserve mental well-being by eating healthy making sure we have breaks um don't work like don't even think about working 24 7 which easily happens maybe not 24 7 but like beyond regular working hours because i mean these working hours have been are in place ever since industrial times because our body needs to recover from mm -hmm. work and so does our brain as we identified it as just another organ <laughs> that needs a break <laughs> at times yeah. Um, to yeah to recover to settle to um, what I've also experienced and I think many listeners will probably also um, can, can relate relate to that is when we walk I, sometimes in my workshop I also have an, a session where I send out people when the weather is nice send them out for a walk to discuss on the topic and that's when ideas come. Um, and spark and that's when you have the best ideas for our next research project that's when you can connect the dots dots of what's been discussed yeah. during the workshop session so our, our brain needs nutrition and workout like physical workout to be functional and breaks to recover yeah. as well um yeah so and, so and also there, there's this this really nice five step program. This is from the New Zealand uh, mental health, mm -hmm. uh, New Zealand public health authorities. Um, five ways to well being, it's called. And you're absolutely right. Sleep, physical activity, um, is are two of them. Um, connecting is two of them. So not being in isolation, but you know, mm -hmm. not isolating yourself, being being in in, in a social surrounding, but not not being alone, is one of them being challenged is one of them if you if your job is sitting in a factory and just doing this uh, you know putting something mm. into a box or something that's not going to keep you mentally healthy so we also need challenges and, and and diverse challenges so it's it's not that we just need to switch our minds off we also need to use our minds to remain mentally healthy and now i of course oh and and the fifth one they mention is is also um to to be, be part of something bigger i, I think they have a, a more succinct way of, of phrasing it um still purpose and work and, and their yeah character. to have a purpose to 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 belong, I, I think it's mostly mm -hmm. part of belonging. Um, mm -hmm. 
just or have dreams or have aspirations or, or that's that's what they name it in the five ways to well-being is and if you give to others if you give your time in supporting others i find for instance my my work as a mental health first aid extremely enriching um, and that gives me a, a sense of purpose um, if, if i didn't already have one i did but uh, it, it makes me feel good about myself I also work with a mental health charity in, in Germany called Irsenig Menschlich, that roughly translates as Madly Human. We go into schools and universities and inform about mental health. It makes me feel like I am part of something bigger. It's not just about me. I, I have a mission, and that enriches my life as well. So these are the five things to give, to connect, sleep, physically active, and what, what was it? now I forget it. Again. Oh, and to, um, to 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 have mentally challenging uh, aspects as, as well. I also forgotten the clever one word description they have for it. But um, these are things that we need to keep in balance for for our mental health um, yeah. to to be as good as it can be. It sounds a little bit like staying human, despite. <laughs> <laughs> the academic challenge <laughs> like mm -hmm. in connection with others learn thrive from each but yeah, with and from each other and also really what good scientific practice is all about at the end of the day mm -hmm. this is also enshrined in many of the research principles that you know certain institutions have postulated for themselves and their staff and what we also know as um, best practices and principles for open science. I believe personally, that's also why I'm so, um, and I think like it makes a lot of sense for me to be working with open science because if we are re-enabled as researchers to work in a purposeful, transparent manner that fosters and serves research integrity as, in accordance with our values as human beings, which the current publishing pressure system contradicts yeah. with, I think then that's also when we can ease a lot of the pressure that eventually some of us drives into mental health issues. Uh, um, I think so too. And I think what it what that requires, we I think we really need to step away. And, and that it requires a realization that the traditional view that science is the product of one or two brilliant minds mm. is outdated and we need to stop and get away from it. Because the reality is, look at any nature or science paper, it's got 30 authors on it. Why? Because the reviewers, they want the genome sequence, they want the animal model experiments, they want the full knockout library and whatnot and this is humanly impossible for a even a small team of researchers to do when i did my phd in the um, late 90s early 2000s it was still possible i had one or two papers just with me and my supervisor i was doing biochemistry and that was okay but by the time i started supervising phds you know with the siRNA experiments that needed doing and the animal experiments that needed doing and whatnot it somebody gets to be the lucky first author but it's it's the luck of the draw and so what are we going to do we're going to give all the credit to that one person up the front and then there's 30 30 other names on there and so it doesn't work that way anymore science is now fundamentally a collaborative process and so we need and I know that there are smart minds thinking about this and we haven't cracked it yet, but we need to come at a different system of evaluating that when it also comes to promotions and yeah. when, how we move people forward. Um, the, you know, the days of Watson and Crick writing their own nature paper with stolen data, mm -hmm. uh, those are over. This is, it's all big teams now. Yeah, this so like my, my my personal um, dogma is you should it shouldn't matter where you publish but what you publish as long as it's discoverable in a digital system that's not perfect as we have it now but it's getting better by the day because as you said many um, people organizations are working towards making a globally inclusive digitally 
ensuring digital discoverability. There's so much research being produced on a daily level that not one researcher can possibly identify all the literature which would um, eventually be relevant to our work. So we need also machine learning to make sense of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and what you just mentioned for research assessment, um, there is SFDORA, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, which is trying to get away from the impact, general impact factor. It, like my trainings are also geared towards societal impact, not journal impact. Um, and that's also what at the end of the day, when what we as researchers want to achieve, we want to, many of us actually want to make the world and leave the world a better place than we found it. Um, and um, without blaming preceding generations, or some of us are to blame, some of us are stuck in the system, but some of us are trying to fix the system. Yeah, I, I, I feel like you and I, we could continue for hours to talk about the various aspects. Of course, um, and we wouldn't fix it. <laughs> so let's just fix it along the way. But yes, so the alternatives are readily available, which is also what I want to showcase with, through my trainings and workshops and materials, most of which are also. But, but the, the competitive nature of science still prevails. And what I advocate is that we embrace it being a collaborative thing mm. and uh, you know maybe we should start looking at alphabetical listing of authorship rather than uh, other types and and yes there are moves into more clearly defining who did what but and i think it also ties in that we need these positions of people who say hey i love working in a sequencing lab let me do that for the rest of my life, please. Don't pressure me into having to become yeah. a professor or an institute leader yeah. or, or whatnot. Yeah. And, no, so, so and in that capacity, to... they can be part of as many scientific papers as they want. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Everybody wins. Yeah, I think there's much room for diversifying the job market around academia. And there is already a few available where they can suddenly be specified further and made more readily available and discoverable for early career researchers before they feel oh i have to become a professor otherwise i'm going to be a taxi driver that's usually the two options that you see early well in look if you really want to dedicate your life to research and development then actually industry is the place to go there is where you can be an active lab researcher to the end mm. of your days, if if that's what you want, yeah. not at universities. Also, I have a brother who's a taxi driver, so that's also an option. <laughs> like, it doesn't have to be the worst, but yeah. um, so long as that is a a career that's fulfilling for for you, it's yeah. all good, you know. And, and I've known many many of my peers that I uh, worked with in in academia um, that. Um, have gone on to do very, very different things. One of my, uh, a chap that I did my PhD with, he's a motivational speaker. Um, you know, people do, and in this week's science, I read a very, very encouraging article, um, the Working Life series about a, a lady um, who had always been an artist on the side, did a lot of drawing, and um, also realized after her postdoc that this trajectory in, into a faculty position wasn't for her. Mm. And, uh, you know, it took her a while to find her feet, but now she's a scientific illustrator. I wanted to be a scientist, or like mm. once I'd committed to that, um, to that trajectory, that's what I wanted. And I wanted to switch into science management. I've, I suddenly realized, hey, this, this is much more me. Um, I was able to use my communicative skills much more than I would in science. And uh, my creative skills, I, uh, you know this, Joe, but I'm, I'm working on a documentary film about microbes at the moment as well. So I'm making a movie right now. Um, and, and so moving into science management, whereas at first it felt like, well, I'm giving up a lot because I'd so much invested in setting up a research group and getting grants and all that um it's, i found it extremely liberating and for me it's very easy five o'clock working day's over see you tomorrow at nine um of course there are exceptions to this there are still deadlines to meet there are always 
exceptions to these things, but my, mm. my working life's far more structured. I spend no weekends in the lab anymore. It makes me very happy and my wife too, I can tell you I that. I was gonna say, from your family as well. <laughs> yeah, it's much more family friendly too. Yeah. So I think a lot of scientists might also be scared about the unknown of what might happen when they leave academia. And I think a lot of them, they don't realize the riches that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, one of the PhDs from, from my program that I manage, um, she is due to defend her PhD in February and mm -hmm. she's walking straight into a consultancy job with a top consultancy firm. She took part in a mentoring program. She walks into a salary that is more than her current jobs, straight as her current boss, straight out of a PhD. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there <laughs> are, and I say this to PhDs and postdocs out there, because I, I also do trainings for job applications and stuff like that, uh, which I developed together with a lady from the firma called SAIS, uh, the, the company called SAIS is based here in Jena. And, a lot of them, it started from people asking me for advice with job applications and, and so on, and turned that into a workshop. Um, and what I opens, notice happens quite often is that people come to me and say, well, look, this job looks really interesting, but they're asking for project management skills. And I haven't got any project management skills. And I always say to them, well, hang on, you're a PhD researcher, right? Yeah. And you've got a research project, right? Yeah. Who's managing that project? <laughs> you are. You are a project uh -huh. manager. So, you know, I tell that now in, at our inductions uh, mm -hmm. for PhDs, you are all project managers. Mm -hmm. um, you might not have thought about it much. You may do well maybe to do a project management training to think about it in a bit more detail. But project management is all about organizing your work. Mm -hmm. And that's what you do as a PhD student so or as a doctoral researcher. No. So you are a project manager. So next time you see an advertisement that says project manager, you know you can apply to it. That's yours, yeah. That's also what I found. For, nobody told me, but I eventually got to myself screening job applications, not job postings I could possibly apply to. And I was like, well, no things for me. And I went, wait a minute. But didn't I, couldn't I name myself a project manager after all? Like, I managed a bloody PhD. Like, hello. Exactly. <laughs> You maybe maybe you manage your supervisor. That's uh, <laughs> that's an important <laughs> skill to have, you know. Well, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Like, I would, let's let's continue the conversation on a future episode. Let's let's. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, um, sure. Joining us. I've also really enjoyed this, um, and I'm I'm always happy to talk about mental health. Anything that I can do to normalize um, that as a topic. Um, and I probably didn't speak as much about my personal experience as I could have. Um, so maybe we can do that on a future occasion. Yes. Yeah, um, very happy to. Because so, I, I find that that sometimes really helps people um, mm. because I, you know, I was down in the pits at some point. And, and sometimes, sometimes people might find that hard to believe, but mm. I, I could barely make it out of bed for weeks on end. You know, I've, that's where I've been, very dark places. And um, yeah, <laughs> not to dampen the mood at the end of this session, but uh, you got out of it. Uh, sometimes now. good for people to hear that and you can come out of it. And, yeah. and what I'd like to say then is that when you overcome it, you know, you're stronger for it. Um, over, really overcoming a problem that you have. There are a few things in life that make you feel good about yourself as overcoming a problem like when i had my anxiety disorder mm -hmm. there was no way i could have had a conversation that i knew was going to be on the internet uh like we've had today so mm -hmm. that is one of the benefits you can reap from overcoming your mental health problems and maybe yeah. that's a good note to end it off same here it's also recent that i started talking about it and i'm using also this podcast to make it more of a topic to yeah to foster the conversation around it and also, as you said, to normalize, like it, it's normal to sometimes not be capable of doing certain things and we need breaks. And I think it's like, a, it's like our body or our brain pulling the brake, like, wait a minute, you've worked too hard. Like, like it, there's, it's a, anyway, okay. 
some, some people call it burnout and it's probably one of the symptoms that are connected to mental health issues. Others say burnout is just another word for the depression or what other disorder mentally. Um, but yeah, so basically it's it's normal, as we said, so let's let's treat it as such and let's figure out ways to be there for each other, to for others who run into episodes of some sort or also to prevent anything like that to happen too seriously. And yeah. when we keep, feel the signs, that's also what I'm continuously learning. When, when is it time for me to take a break so that it doesn't get so serious again? But that's for a future episode and we okay happy to do that yeah and i can probably also put together a few resources i'm in the process of putting up a, a page on my website as a as a resource page for mental well-being sure. and yeah and there will also be shared in the show notes so you can just click um find the link um underneath the the play button of this episode excellent so, See you on a future episode. All right. Thank you.